This meeting is now being recorded. Hello again. Uh, we're on to week 11, which is crazy. Just a few more weeks left for you guys in this semester. Um, we're going to talk about the fetal neck and spine um, and the abnormalities associated with it. Uh, so we'll start off like we always do. We're going to go through some normal anatomy um, to give you guys some more review, and then we'll go over that and um, start talking about uh, the abnormal fetal neck and spine. So we'll start here.
All right. So let's go through those to see how you did. So name the part of the vertebral body. So vertebral body. So this is the part of the uh, spinal column that um, is more um, towards um, the middle of baby. So this is the uh, the two posterior portions that we see, and then the anterior portion is the vertebral body. Um, noted one kidney here and one kidney here. So what are we looking at here? This is the nuchal translucency. So this is a fetus in the uh, first trimester. We know that because this nuchal translucency is going to turn into the nuchal fold as the baby gets older. So nuchal translucency is what we're looking at. Is this a good image in order to assess the posterior skin line? So we want to make sure that we see the skin line that's intact behind the spine to rule out any spina bifida. Uh, this is um, a no. So we want the fetus prone. We don't want the baby on their back because we can't properly assess that skin line. So if, if the fetus is supine, then we can't um, assess what we need to. Name the part of the vertebral body. Vertebral body again. So the same portion of the uh, vertebrae that um, we were looking at in transverse, we can see now in sagittal. And what are we looking at here? So this is the nuchal region of the fetus. So this is the skull. We can see the spine here. Baby's obviously uh, flexed back of it because you can see the skin how it's like bulged a bit there. It's just kind of puckering because baby's starting to get some baby fat, and that's um, the fat behind the neck when baby's tipped back. Uh, and then we can see the chin down here. So baby's looking um, towards the back of the image, so they're prone. So this is the image behind the neck, which is the nuchal region. And what are we looking at here? So we're looking at the spine, specifically the L-spine. And here, so rhombencephalon. So this is that area um, in the brain, part of um, the embryological development of the head. It's the hindbrain that we can see between eight and 10 weeks um, on ultrasound. And here we have part of the hip. So this is the ilium. So we can see the spine here. This is a coronal image. So you can see the ribs on both sides. And then we have our hips down here. All right, so this one is the esophagus. So the esophagus is only ever seen if there's fluid in it. So this baby must have been swallowing at this moment. Um, so this is the tube here that's full of the amniotic fluid um, that represents the esophagus. Is this NT measurement normal? So if we look down in the corner, we're seeing 1.7 millimeters, so that's a yes. So anything less than three is considered normal. <clears throat> and here we're looking at the spine again, specifically the C-spine. Baby's prone, so this would be a good um, image to assess the skin line. You can see how it's nice and intact behind that spine there. Uh, what's being measured and what is the normal measurement? So we're obviously in the posterior fossa because we can see the cerebellum and the cisterna magna. So this is the nuchal fold. Um, and less than six millimeters is considered normal measurement. So here we have a first trimester fetus and we're looking at um, the spine. So we can see the vertebrae here going down the back, very early spine um, and spinal um, cord in the middle there. So this is a first trimester spine, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> and here, so this is a blurry picture, um, but it's obviously the rhombencephalon. So we have that tiny little um, gum, gummy bear looking baby. So first trimester, we're doing a crown rump length. So we can see there the rhombencephalon. So we're obviously between eight and 10 weeks somewhere. And name the part of the vertebrae. So this is the lamina. So those two um, areas that make up the posterior portion of the uh, vertebral 
Um, the vertebrae, I should say, are the lamina. So again, vertebral body, kidney, and kidney. And the arrow is pointing here to the posterior skin line. So we have our transverse spine here. We're up a little higher because we can see ribs, one here, one here, and behind we have the skin line. So that's um, the important area that we want to make sure is intact. And here we just, um, we're looking at this and a few images before, we're looking at the nuchal fold again. So posterior fossa, so cerebellum, um, cisterna magna, nuchal fold. So these three um, structures can be measured all in the same image um, when we're in the correct plane. <clears throat> and this image, so um, we can see the spine, the bony spine here, and in between that we see the spinal cord. So this is all spinal cord. Um, material in the middle of the bony portion of the spine. Name the part of the vertebrae, the vertebrae. so this is the posterior arch. So this, uh, the portion that's in, um, I should say it's posterior because this is a back of baby, but in this image it's anterior because baby's prone, uh, is the posterior arch. <clears throat> so I should say the part that's more towards the outside of baby's skin is the posterior arch of the vertebrae. Is this nuchal fold measurement normal? So we're measuring back here. So they're measuring well outside occipital bone to outside uh, skin line, 5.19 millimeters. So that's a yes. So anything less than six, we're good. <clears throat> is this NT measurement normal? So nuchal translucency. So we look down here, we're 3.1 millimeters, so that's a no. So anything over three uh, is considered abnormal. And here, so we're looking at a nice prone spine here, and the X is on the posterior skin line, so making sure that's nice and intact, nice and smooth with no defects within it. And this X is representing the spine and the thoracic region. And then, is this a good image in order to assess the posterior skin line? So baby's prone, so we can see the spine is up, but baby's pressed right against the uterus, so we can't even see the skin behind the spine. So that's uh, definitely a no. We can't um, properly assess the skin line in this image. So we're looking at this zoomed up prone baby again. So this X, so where this is the anterior portion, uh, excuse me, the portion of the neck anterior to the spine. So this is just generally baby's neck. So this is where you would find the thyroid. <clears throat> is this a good image in order to assess the posterior skin line? Yes, this is beautiful. So we can see the skin line pretty much all the way from the head down to the bottom. Uh, nice, pretty parallel spine here and nice uh, intact skin line. So this is perfect. And we're back looking at the hips and coronal. So this is the ischium. Is this NT measurement normal? So we're looking at the measurement here and the number is 2.64. So that would be a yes or less than three. And nuchal fold, is this normal? So 0.91 centimeters, so no. So that's greater than six millimeters. So that's abnormal. Uh, just looking at it, even without the calipers, you could probably tell that looks pretty thick. <laughs> and here we're looking at the S spine, the very tip. So we want to make sure that that spine comes to a point at the end of the bottom and not doesn't end abruptly um, to rule out any um, abnormalities as far as uh, spina bifida that don't protrude through the skin or caudal regression syndrome. And this area here, we have the rhombencephalon again. So we have a tiny little embryo here. And that anechoic area in the posterior head is the rhombencephalon. All right, so we'll start to talk about embryology. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the spine, so the CNS, or the central nervous, central nervous system, um, is um, considered the neural tube in the embryo. So folding of the ectoderm of the neural plate creates the neural tube by the third week. So this embryologic process um, will create that neural tube by week three. 
The fusion of the neural groove is a two-day process. So um, it begins at the mid-embryo and then ends at the cranial and caudal ends. So it begins um, in the middle of the embryo and then it moves itself out um, kind of evenly towards the outside uh, top and bottom of the fetus. You can see um, kind of represented here, starts in the middle and then closes off on either end. Um, so uh, any disruption in this process, uh, infections, drugs, genetics uh, can result in a failure of closure and that's where we get those. Um, CNS anom uh, anomalies. Yep, so disruption of this process uh, results in failure of closure, causing the neural tube defects like spina bifida. So I was just saying infection, any sort of illicit drugs or even um, prescribed drugs that are considered um, unsafe in pregnancy, genetics. So this neural tube will start to close from the middle and then the top um, or the bottom won't close completely. So continuing on, so third week we have the neural tube. Fourth week the spine begins to mineralize, so those bony processes will start to um, become harder. Uh, and then into the third trimester the spine uh, development completes. So it's a pretty long process for the spine to develop compared to some other structures within the fetus. So we'll talk about the abnormal feel neck. We're going to start with a cystic hygroma. So we've heard this a lot before. Um, so this is a blockage of the lymphatic sacs lateral to the jugular veins causing a lymph fluid collection. So this um, backup of lymph fluid will um, increase the size of the um, nuchal translucency and the skin around the fetal neck. Um, it can extend down baby's back and all the way around baby if it's really severe. Um, the backup of uh, lymph fluid may accompany high drops as well. Um, if it does, this is this process is called um, lymph angiectasia. Lymph angiectasia. Excuse me. <clears throat> so sonographic appearance, we have a single or multi-loculated fluid-filled cavity. Uh, the size does vary greatly. Uh, it can be really small, just kind of isolated to the neck, or large like this one we're seeing here that we can see almost like a spacesuit all the way around baby, so fluid all the way um, under all the skin that's surrounding baby. Um, so the posterior lateral neck region is the most common area for cystic hygroma, um, and like I just said, it may extend all the way around the fetus. So differentials for cystic hygroma, so um, cystic teratomas, uh, cephalocele's, hemangiomas, brachial cleft cysts, and uh, nuchal edema or nuchal um, trans translucency thickening. So we have a normal head and transverse. So this is a first trimester um, head. We can see the early brain here, the um, cord plexus. And this is the same image here. So we have the head and then look at this large hygroma here. So sitting all the way out around the head, we have those septations in there. That's very um, characteristic of a cystic hygroma. Um, so very um, obvious on this image. This is just um, another image of a cystic hygroma. So it's kind of difficult to interpret. Uh, but this is further along in the pregnancy because we can see a well-established placenta here. It's like a grade one, so we're probably somewhere in early to mid-second trimester. Uh, but these are uh, vertebrae here, so I think we're probably towards the bottom of the spine. But we can't really even see any amniotic fluid. It's all cystic agroma. So you can see like the separations here within the cystic areas. So oligohydramnios is common with a cystic hygroma if it's big enough because there's no space for the fluid to go. <clears throat> the association between cystic hygromas and many chromosomal anomalies and defects um, is pretty high. So if you ever see cystic hygroma and what it's related to, the first thing you should think of is Turner syndrome. Um, it can be related to Down syndrome, but um, Turner syndrome is um, something that we 
want to connect with cystic hygroma when it comes to answering some questions. Um, so the combination of a hygroma with non-immune high drops has a strong association with an abnormal karyotype. So if this baby had a cystic hygroma and a fluid collections within the chest, uh, in the belly, um, and baby had high drops, that is very highly indicative of uh, abnormal karyotype. Um, this combination of a hygroma and high drops has a mid-gestation mortality of near 100%. Um, so not a great prognosis for those babies. Um, and again, Turner syndrome, high association of relation to cystic hygroma. So we'll talk about the abnormal fetal spine. So spina bifida. So this is um, an issue in the babies where there is an incomplete closure of the bony elements of the spine posteriorly. So this is similar to those um, that encephalocele that we were talking about last week. So incomplete closure of the uh, part of the head um, causing a protrusion of the um, neural elements. So uh, here we have incomplete closure of the spine, so the posterior spine, which is the lamina and the spinous process. <clears throat> um, causes of this, uh, so again, related to teratogens, uh, diabetes, um, again, uh, obesity and folate in, uh, deficiency. So um, those uh, moms who take folic acid before or when they become pregnant are smart because that helps and prevent these CNS um, anomalies from happening. So there are two types of lesions that are characterized when it comes to um, spina bifida. So we have the ventral and the dorsal. So the ventral, um, the vertebral body splitting and, uh, it, excuse me, the vertebral body splits and is of a neurogenic origin uh, with cystic structures. So the location of this is usually lower and lower cervical and upper thoracic spine. And then the dorsal, we have the split vertebrae again. Um, it can happen as an open or a closed defect. So an open defect would be not covered by skin and closed would be covered by skin. Um, and these usually occur at the sacro-lumbar level. So the most common area for a spina bifida is the, the distal spine, so that sacro-lumbar level. <clears throat> So just kind of looking at the ventral versus the dorsal areas. So ventral, we have the upper uh, thoracic lower cervical. And then dorsal, we have kind of towards the distal spine, we have the spina bifida occulta, which is um, a closed defect, and spina bifida aperta, which is an open defect. So spina bifida occulta, also known as closed spina bifida. So this is the simplest form. Um, this vertebrae, the vertebrae are still split. They're just covered by skin. So this defect never makes it um, through the posterior skin um, while it stays um, under the skin, um, just kind of involving the spine. Um, a lot of babies who have spina bifida occulta are born um, with a dimple on their skin in the area where this is happening. Um, and a lot of them also have a small patch of hair that is right um, above the defect of the spina bifida occulta. Um, there are ultrasounds done um, on baby, on newborn babies who have um, dimples, sacral dimples. So they look for the spinal cord to make sure it's in the right spot and there's no defects um, in the spine. So spina bifida occulta can be difficult to see on ultrasound because there it is a closed defect and there's no obvious posterior um, skin line kind of interruption. So this is a um, coronal image of a defect that is closed. So we can see that the spine is kind of starting to lay out, getting wider. It's because there's a defect in the middle here. The so same over here. We have those that vertebrae kind of splaying out, getting wider. <clears throat> and then we have our spina bifida aperta, which is our open spina bifida. So 
uh, full thickness defect of the skin, underlying soft tissues, and vertebral arches. So that defect in the uh, spinous, uh, bony spinous processes, um, process, excuse me, extends all the way out uh, through the skin. Um, this accounts for 85% of all spina bifida cases. So this is a lot more common than the closed spina bifida. And there are two different kinds of uh, open spina bifida, the meningocele and the myelomeningocele. So a meningocele is a thin meningeal uh, membrane that does not contain neural tissue, so it just contains uh, CSS, so cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, so this will be um, anechoic. Um, and myelomeningocele will contain that fluid as well, but it will also have neural tissue um, within the protruding sac. So kind of like the encephalocele that has um, brain tissue within it, um, myelomeningocele has neural tissue within the sac. So here are um, two different um, spina bifida defects. So we have our meningocele, which is just the fluid. So we can see the defect in the posterior skin line kind of protruding out. And then myelomeningocele, we can see that it's a more complex in there, so that's the neural tissue um, uh, in the posterior skin line. Uh, it can be difficult to tell the difference on ultrasound because <clears throat> uh, meningocele's fluid is not always going to be perfectly anechoic. It, it could be um, heterogeneous. So we can see that there's a defect, but sometimes we can't tell which one it is. So we're talking about uh, open defects on the baby, whether it be abdominal or spinal or in the head. Um, we talk about um, maternal serum AFP. So we know that the AFP is um, produced in the fetal liver. So if the baby has an opening somewhere, it's gonna leak out into the amniotic fluid, going through the placenta and into the mom's bloodstream. So when we're talking about spina bifida, um, we have one type of spina bifida with a normal AFP and one with an elevated. So spina bifida occulta, which is the closed a uh, spina bifida, will have a normal AFP. So there's no opening in the baby for that um, AFP to leak into the amniotic fluid. Unlike the spina bifida aperta that's open, uh, that will leak that AFP into the fluid, causing maternal serum AFP to increase. So on ultrasound, the greatest detection of spina bifida happens in a sagittal plane. Um, it's easier to see that defect um, in the back. Um, and if we want to rule out smaller defects, uh, we want to look in transverse. So this would be our small apertas and our spina bifida occultas. The so spina bifida in transverse. So our um, the displaying of the posterior ossification centers is a good indicator that there's a defect um, present. So we can see that this is the vertebral body here. And then our posterior ossification centers are supposed to be kind of in a triangular um, configuration with this uh, vertebral body, but they're splayed out, uh, kind of making a V or a U shape. So this is representing a defect that's kind of pushing out those um, ossification centers, which is right here. Um, and same here, this is a more obvious defect back here, but these. Um, spinous um, or posterior uh, ossification centers are blade. And then sagittal, um, we can detect the location a lot easier. So we can tell where we are in the spine, whether it be uh, in the sacral region or the lumbar region, um, and also the severity. So we can see how big the defect is, how many vertebrae it um, involves and then how large it is. Um, and there's a disruption in the curvature, normal curvature of the spine, which is best seen in the sagittal plane as well. So we have a sag here. So we have this spine here, and then we can see obviously the defect back here. And then we have our transverse um, defect here. We're obviously low because we can see the bladder. So this is, we're in the most common area for a defect. Uh, second trimester hydrocephalus is uh, very common with uh, spina bifida, uh, seen in 70% of spina bifida cases. Um, and 
70 percent of spina bifida cases combined and 100 percent of spina bifida aperta so that open spina bifida hydrocephalus is guaranteed to happen um they can present um with uh other anomalies as well so uh, bilateral club feet club feet excuse me Rocker bonafide and hip deformities are common. Um, this has to do with the abnormal configuration of the spine in the lower half of the body, which creates um, abnormal configuration of the lower body. So what increases the diagnosis of an open spina bifida by nearly 100%? There is a kind of associated condition with Spina bifida that happens nearly 100% of the time that we can see on ultrasound that increases that diagnosis um, to that 100% level. So that is Arnold Curie malformation, specifically type 2. So this is our banana sign and our lemon sign. So the cerebellum is sunk down into the upper spinal column, obliterating the cisterna magna, and that head is lemon shaped. Um, because of the loss of tissue in the back of the brain. So we have our banana cerebellum, and then we have those kind of scalloped um, borders on either side of the head, making the skull lemon-shaped. A normal cerebellum and a and cisterna magna nearly uh, exclude, or virtually exclude myelomeningocele. So if we see a normal, um, cerebellum and cisterna magna, we can definitely exclude that open spina bifida. Um, it may be still, we may still see a closed one, but it's um, very uncommon that we would see um, a normal posterior fossa with a myelomeningocele pretty uh, near to 0% of the time. <clears throat> so difference between open and closed spina bifida, so we have our open banana sign, lemon sign head closed normal brain anatomy so if it's closed there's that um spinal cord spinal column is not going to be disrupted so that the posterior brain contents fall down into the back of the head um so all the brain anatomy will be uh normal prognosis in this case depends on the level of the defect so if it's um, higher or lower, it will depend on um, what it affects within the fetus or the baby. Um, another good view of looking at a spina bifida is in coronal. So we can see the splaying of the vertebrae in coronal if it's a closed defect. So that's pretty handy. So uh, sagittal transverse and coronal are all good. Um, um, tools to use, uh, and especially 3D. 3D can help um, kind of identify where um, the level of the spina bifida is happening. So, do you have a spina bifida on an ultrasound that we'll look at here? Blow that out of this. So this is baby's head. So we can see they're scanning through. We can see the banana sign, which is the cerebellum. And we're going transverse down the spine, U-shaped arch, so splayed posterior elements of the spine, which is abnormal. We're looking in coronal. See that defect right in here. So myelomeningocele, determine that there's spinal tissue within that defect. So that is what um, spina bifida looks like on ultrasound. Um, there are ways to fix spina bifida, um, obviously when babies are born, but they can, uh, they also perform fetal surgery, which is crazy. I mean, I just have a small video on that um, just because it's pretty interesting.
So myelomeningocele is the most common form of spina bifida, and it results from lack of closure of the primitive spinal cord, which is the neural tube, fetus, uh, at the bottom end. So the spinal cord and nerve roots and covering layers of the spinal cord are fused to the skin and muscle. And, uh, it leaks the spinal fluid out and leads to other complications over time, including a Chiari malformation and subsequent hydrocephalus, or the buildup of spinal fluid in the head. And uh, patients who undergo postnatal closure have an approximate 80% risk of hydrocephalus requiring placement of a ventricular peritoneal shunt, which is an implanted device. Um, unfortunately, shunts are associated with a lot of morbidity and complications during childhood and, and uh, life for uh, children with spina bifida and myelomeningocele. So why do we do this in utero? Um... For generations, this repair has been done postnatally. But as pediatric surgeons and neurosurgeons, what we found is that over time, where the die is already cast by the time the baby's born. Obstetricians have noticed for several for years now that they've been able to see many of these fetuses moving their legs in utero, but by the time they're born, they're no longer able to move their legs and they're paralyzed. So it was thought really that there's some ongoing injury that occurs during the pregnancy. The goal of doing this operation early, before birth, is to try to improve the function of the baby, to improve their leg strength, and perhaps their bowel and bladder function, and also, importantly, to minimize the risk of developing hydrocephalus, that condition fluid on the brain. And when they do develop hydrocephalus and they need a shunt, those shunts, unfortunately, don't work perfectly, and they lead to all kinds of complications. And it turns out that by doing this operation before birth, it, it seems to cut that shunt rate in half. And so we're very optimistic that we can have that same result for this infant. The patient is uh, Naomi. Uh, she's 23 years old. And uh, this is essentially her first uh, pregnancy to this point. And uh, the baby is around 25 weeks gestation. Remembering, of course, that a uh, normal pregnancy gestation is around 40 weeks. So we're just a little tiny bit over halfway in the, uh, the pregnancy. The baby has an open uh, spinal defect called a spina bifida. And uh, the object of the surgery today is to uh, close that lesion for a number of reasons. The leakage of the fluid out of this open lesion uh, does two things at least that we know of. One is to expose the nerves to the amniotic fluid, and two is to allow the leaking of fluid such that the cerebellum at the base of the brain can uh, undergo pressure. This is called the Chiari II malformation. And that kind of pressure on the uh, intracranial structures can result both in uh, issues with the cerebellum and with the, uh, the ventricles of the brain, so the baby's ventricles can become dilated. So by closing this lesion, we're hoping uh, to prevent ongoing injury and, uh, and hopefully preserve neurologic function. And in even some cases, we believe it's possible to regain some uh, neurologic function. It's a rather tricky operation that we did today. Uh, it's open fetal surgery. So the mother is asleep under a very deep anesthetic. We have to then perform a, a C-section type incision on the mother to open up her tummy and to expose the uterus. And then we have to open the uterus. This is the pregnant uterus that's filled with the amniotic fluid. So we have to open that up and the amniotic fluid will come out. And then we expose this spina bifida deformity in the fetus and then the neurosurgeons dr bolo and jay today came in and did that repair of that spina bifida defect then very importantly we then have to close that uterus up with stitches and keep it pregnant and keep the baby inside the uterus and we have to have it so it doesn't leak that amniotic fluid and that the pregnancy can continue and that's where this becomes pretty tricky and pretty difficult well, so far, the operation went perfectly today. Uh, we uh, were able to open the uterus very nicely, uh, expose the deformity in the fetus, 
the spina bifida repair seemed to go very smoothly and we were able to get that uterus closed up very nicely. And so far, mom and baby are recovering very well. Uh, I don't see any signs of labor. Uh, the uterus seems to be snugly closed and the mother uh, is now uh, recovering from the anesthesia and she's doing very well. It was a, you know, it was really a multidisciplinary total force with all the different disciplines present. Everybody worked well, seamlessly, perfectly. It was a well choreographed, perfectly executed surgical procedure. It's not often that surgeons use superlatives, but this is actually one of those times that I think it's rightfully deserved. So that's pretty cool that they can do uh, fetal surgery like that. They can do that on multiple different things. Um, we'll see a little bit more of that uh, later. So we're going to talk about um, abnormal curvatures within the spine. So um, a lateral curvature is called a scoliosis, and then anterior is called kyphosis. Uh, and if there is both a lateral and anterior curvature, it's kyphoscoliosis. So. We can see those in the fetus when we're scanning. Uh, scoliosis happens due to the anomalous development of the vertebrae, so the failure, failure of, uh, formation or segmentation of the different um, vertebrae. So we get this lateral curvature that's abnormal. So we can see here, this is a coronal image. So the spine should be straight in a coronal image, straight from head to, to bottom. Um, we can see it's kind of curving off to baby's right side here. So this is a scoliosis defect within the fetus. So it's most often seen on ultrasound with hemivertebrae. So a hemivertebrae is aplasia or dysgenesis of one of the two uh, chondrification centers that form the vertebral bodies. So we have a um, reconstructed image here that has a hemivertebrae. So you can see how this kind of wedged vertebrae here could cause um, a curve in the spine. Uh, we can see that here on ultrasound, we have that almost looks like a kink in the spine. Um, and um, sonographically, we're going to see it uh, obviously as uh, an abnormal lateral curvature, but um, that lateral displacement of the anterior ossification centers um, or improperly aligned uh, vertebral bodies. So kyphosis, so that anterior angulation. So this is an image of a very sharp um, angled uh, scoliosis. Um, and then we have a kyphosis here. So this is a lateral and this is an anterior. So kyphosis is difficult to see in one image. Um, same with scoliosis, really. Um, so live scanning is best to detect angulation um, in this plane. So called a regression syndrome, we've talked about this before. So this is a group of congenital anomalies affecting the caudal spine and cord hindgut urogenital system and lower limbs. So this has a broad range, so it can range from agenesis of the coccyx uh, to absent sacral lumbar and lower thoracic vertebrae. So the bottom half of the baby is missing, uh, depending on the severity. So who's at an increased risk for having a fetus with caudal regression syndrome? So caudal regression syndrome, if you hear that term, you should think diabetes. The diabetic mom, so increases the risk uh, by 250 times. So that's huge. So sonographically, we're going to see the lumbar and sacral spine um, having isolated anomalies uh, or coexisting uh, club feet and knee and hip contractures. Um, that abrupt kind of termination of the spine here um, we're seeing in the image. Um, if we don't have a pointed um, part of the spine in the lumbar sacral region uh, towards the tailbone, then we um, should uh, think caudal regression syndrome along with um, closed spina bifida. So sagittal and transverse views will display vertebral absence with caudal regression. So we have um, the hip bones here, and then we have an absent sacrum. So um, we 
should be seeing the spine, obviously, between those two hip bones, the iliac wings. And what is the main differential for caudal regression syndrome? So if we remember that from the beginning of class, uh, sirenomelia or mermaid syndrome. So that's when the legs are stuck together, um, making the bottoms of the legs and feet look like a mermaid fin. Uh, but this is the main differential for um, caudal regression. So sacrococcygeal teratomas. These, these are the most common uh, neoplasm within the newborn. Uh, so this is a teratoma that arises from the neural tube. Um, so if we remember way back to last semester, um, we remember uh, teratomas or dermoid cysts. So teratomas um, can develop in the gonads, uh, umbilical cord placenta, or anywhere on the neural tube. So it doesn't, doesn't happen just in the ovaries or the testes. Um, a sacrococcygeal teratoma will include neural, gastrointestinal, and respiratory tissue. So if we remember from the dermoid cysts and the teratomas in the ovary, they tend to have hair or teeth um, or sweat glands. So this teratoma has uh, neural, gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal, and respiratory tissue. So the most common location within the neural tube for a sacrococcygeal teratoma is the sacrococcygeal region. So that's the name. So it comes in, coming off. Um, the area of baby's bottom rising from the presacral area of the spine. Sonographic appearance, so protrusion between anus and the coccyx of a big mass. A solid, it could be solid or complex with cystic components. Um, the choroid plexus is what creates the fluid seen within the mass. So if we remember that the choroid plexus creates the um, cerebral spinal fluid. So that's the fluid that's seen within the mass. <clears throat> there are different types depending on um, the mass contents and the, the location, either internal and external um, or both. So type one is mainly cystic, type two is cystic and solid, type three is solid, and type four is accompanied by non-immune high drops with a large intra-abdominal mass. So this does not protrude outside of the fetus. So type one, we have mainly cystic. Uh, most of the sacrococcygeal teratoma is outside of the baby. There may be a little piece inside, but we have mostly cystic components to it. Type two is a combo, cystic and solid. Uh, about half and half inside and outside the baby. Um, so we have that defect outside and then some within the abdominal cavity. Type three is um, mainly solid. So we can see the solid mass here. Uh, it tends to be outside and uh, quite a big portion inside the baby as well. And then type four is the one that's accompanied by high drops. Um, and is in the anterior intra-abdominal region, so not outside the baby at all. Um, we have this image of it right here, and then we have the accompanied eye drops. We have that anasarca, so that skin um, edema, uh, pleural effusions, pericardial effusions. Um, so that's type four. So let's watch a video of a sacrococcygeal teratoma. This is an ultrasound of the teratoma. We're looking at the baby. We're looking, going down the spine from the head to the bottom. So the sonographer is putting an arrow where they see the, the abnormality, which is always a good idea if it's um, something that's discrete or even if 
Um, it's not. Just make sure to take an image with and without. <clears throat> So this area here looks pretty cystic, so that's probably a type 1, so um, mainly cystic tissue there. Uh, there is an increased risk for congestive heart failure and high drops within um, babies with a sacrococcygeal teratoma, even if it's not a type 4. So um, that mass is large, so it takes a lot of heart power to pump um, the blood to the mass and uh, through the mass. So that can cause high cardiac or high high output cardiac failure, I should say, um, which makes the heart work extra hard, which makes it uh, larger, so causing cardiomegaly. So this is a common finding with a sacrococcygeal teratoma. Uh, these can be fixed after um, birth and also um, in fetal surgery. So I'll watch another short video about uh, fetal surgery with a sacrococcygeal teratoma. This is why we came here was for that hope that they would be able to help her. We found out we were expecting this was going to be our last baby we had four other kids even though it was my fifth you're still concerned and still hold your breath through each and every ultrasound the tech had said that there was a large mass that was coming off of her tailbone area they said it was about the size of the baby our ob sat down with us and explained to us what it was and that most likely because of how vascular blood fills the tumor was that she would have less than a 10 surviving you know we were just kind of in a state of shock honestly not really knowing how to respond my ob continued to help find doctors that knew anything about this it was actually texas children's that called us said your ob and another specialist called and told us about your situation for the first time we at least knew that that good or bad the outcome, we were in a place that they were going to walk us through the whole thing. So not okay. If there's any place that it could happen, you know, this would be the place. They said we're going to pull together a big team meeting. I think there was 30 specialists. They let us know afterwards that it was a unanimous decision by every single specialist here that that she would be a candidate for fetal surgery, and uh, probably the, one of the things that brings me the most uh, comfort, and that meant so much to me during that time, was as sick as she was in 25, a 25 week baby, that they saw her life worth fighting for. They said, you have till tomorrow noon, we need to know if you want to move forward. And we just felt like we can't say no to her. And so we, yeah, well, let's do it. I knew it was gonna be a long surgery. We had talked to the doctors beforehand and just kind of went down the list. And said, you know, if she doesn't, we, we said we didn't want her to suffer more. If it doesn't look like she's going to make it, just hold her and just tell her we love her and that we fought for her. We didn't know. You know, they gave updates throughout the whole time, and all those came back real positive. One of the big ones they were looking for was the, the moment they took the, the tumor off. They wanted to see how her heart responded. That was a, a huge step in, the, in that side as well. They're bringing her back into the 
recovery room and she just looked up and she said, and she didn't ask anything else, she just said, is, is Macy okay? Like, then she immediately just, you know, fell right back asleep. At week 35, she was born. She was doing great. It was this very sweet day. Mm -hmm. She's beautiful, beautiful, perfect. If we didn't tell people the story, they would never, they wouldn't have a clue. There's just no evidence apart from the scar that reminds you that she's gone through anything of that nature. Incredible. If there's a little mark there, I'm, I'm not bothered at all by that because I just feel it's a gift. You know, it saved her life. And um, not everyone gets it. So we are so So very cool that they can do that and help prevent that high output cardiac failure and help um, those babies just live a normal life. So that is all for fetal spine. Um, I hope you guys have a good rest of your week. If you have any questions, uh, let me know. Um, and I'll see you next week.